And from the first day, every week, at least once a week, sometimes twice a week, I was able to preach to absolutely hopeless, desperate and forgotten people and to see them being reconciled with God through the blood of Jesus when they responded to the gospel. These six months, you know, when the number of attendees grew up from something like 20 to maybe more than 200 within six months, these were the best six months, not only of my prison life, but they were the best six months of my life, period. I've never experienced so many people responding positively to the gospel that I preach. It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is Peter Yashik, and we're going to be discussing his new book, Imprisoned with ISIS, Faith in the Face of Evil. Peter, it is truly an honor. Welcome to the show. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, I appreciate that. Well, let's kick off our conversation with a bit of what we might call the Peter Yashik origin story. So for those of us encountering you for the first time, I think a great place to start will be some of the challenges you and your family encountered while you were growing up in Czechoslovakia. How did that form your view, form your understanding of the world? I grew up in a pastor's family under communist oppression in communist Czechoslovakia. You know, I have lived 26 years of my life under communism. And I have experienced persecution since the early time at school, you know, when uh, uh, me, because I'm the youngest child of four, and uh, we were not the only one usually were not the pioneers uh, uh, members, you know, uh, unlike the other schoolmates. So we were always kind of putting aside, you know, the life of the school. When I was about a freshman, I think, in high school, you know, there was a time when shortly before that I was baptized, you know, when I made this commitment of my life to Christ, you know, that happened after one uh, uh, summer camp, uh, youth camp in a so-called Eastern Germany at that time, you know, at uh, the Baltic uh, Sea. And uh, I remember that that was the time, you know, when I made this commitment, you know, to follow Christ in my life. And shortly after that, I asked my father to baptize me. Not a long time after that, the persecution really started in a full power. You know, my father was a pastor in the official church, but that church was very much monitored by secret police. In every church at that time, we used to have one or two secret co-workers of secret police. So my parents, both of them actually were very active in the underground church, organizing discipleship training courses for young people from various denominations. Some people were actually from no church. They just were believers in Christ, and they gathered together. You know, I remember we had probably sometimes more than 50 people in our house for an extended weekend. And, of course, such event uh, early after that, you know, became in the focus of the secret police. And I was a freshman in high school and returned home one day and realized that both of my parents were missing. They were interrogated, arrested, interrogated by secret police uh, at two different places at the same time so that they could not communicate with each other. And I think that was a moment when what we somehow expected that may come arrived. And uh, I remember when my parents returned home after the interrogation because uh, they were released on the same day. My father, when he saw me and my, you know, being scared from the first visible persecution, he went to his library and just brought me the book written by Richard Wurmbrandt, you know, the founder of the Voice of the Martyrs internationally. And that book was called In God's Underground. When I read about Richard's life, you know, and that was the intention and why my father gave me this book, you know, he said, read this book, it will encourage your faith. And I can honestly say that when I read about the way how the Lord supported Richard and uh, how, uh, you know, was uh, uh, sustaining him and giving him strength to go through beatings, torture, brainwashing. I stopped being afraid of persecution. I can say that after the Bible, this is the second most important book in my life. And that actually was also the start of the idea of me later on working for The Voice of the Martyrs, because 
We know from Daniel 2.21 that the Lord is the one who is setting up kings and who is removing kings. And that happened in November 1989. We got the freedom back. We Christians that we were once persecuted but helped by many courageous brothers and sisters from Western countries who dared to secretly bring Bibles and Christian literature into Czechoslovakia and risking their time in prison or lives. We were set free, and we considered it as a privilege that we can now serve our brothers and sisters who are still experiencing the persecution. And that happened very early after the fall of communism, actually in 1992, in the democratic Czechoslovakia, when we founded the Voice of the Martyrs there. And Peter, in terms of the work that you've done with Voice of the Martyrs, what specifically were you doing and what were some of the places you felt called to or maybe what were some of the people groups, so to speak, that you really had a passion to minister to? You know, I am one of the co-founding members of the Czech Voice of the Martyrs. So I worked, you know, uh, in a healthcare for 20 years. 10 years I was a hospital administrator. So since 2002, I started to work full time for the Voice of the Martyrs in the United States. And I was overseeing large area initially, I know, from Central Asia through Middle East, some parts of Europe, and of course, Africa. And as the work kept growing, I kept handing over parts of this large area to my new colleagues. And since 2011, I was actually overseeing only Africa, but only is uh, in inverted commas, because uh, in the moment when I got arrested in Sudan, I was overseeing like nearly 300 different projects in 27 African countries. And I can say that my heart was somehow with Africa and their people, their Christians uh, who are experiencing terrible persecution in many countries. You know, I can say that the Lord gave me a privilege to meet Christians who have not only lost their material things like house being uh, burned and looted or destroyed, cars being destroyed or burned. I met even those who have lost their beloved ones, you know, parents, children, brothers, sisters. And often I was literally weeping with those who weep. But the Lord gave me a special privilege to meet uh, people whom I consider heroes of faith. Those who have also lost parts of their own bodies because they didn't want to renounce their Christian faith. You know, in the Muslim countries where Muslim extremists are, are attacking Christians, you know, they're following the instruction of their founder, Muhammad, you know, that is written in the book of Hadith, that uh, those who do not want to become Muslims, and they resist, and they are Christians, they should cut off their left arm and right leg. And I can tell you honestly that I was sitting at the table and interviewing and helping later on people who have, when I was just looking during the interview, I noticed, you know, that they were missing either Uh, left hand, left arm, or right leg, or both. And I I consider that that was a privilege, and I have learned a lot from those people. I often heard from them, you know, that they considered the persecution as a privilege. I know it sounds a bit strange to people who are living in the free countries, but that's what Paul actually says in Philippians 1.29. He says, it has been granted to you as a privilege, not only to believe in God, but also to suffer for his name. And this is what I've heard many times from them. And uh, of course, you know, at first I was just thinking, okay, you know, that's their understanding, you know, that's great that they understand it like that. But when I experienced persecution in the Sudanese prison, having been slandered, beaten, tortured by the ISIS guys who were sharing the cell with me, the first cell for two months, I can say that at first I was literally saying, Lord, I don't want this privilege. It was too hard. I think that it only feels like a privilege when it's over. And that's what I heard from those people who absolutely must have uh, gone through a period of time when they were deeply traumatized. But I can say that, and I've seen this in their eyes, that the joy of the Lord became their strength in Nehemiah 8.10. You know, and that was a wonderful. And then... Of course, it was a privilege to share those stories with Christians in free countries. And, uh, you know, I was encouraging others to consider persecution as an essential part of a Christian life. That's what the Lord Jesus was teaching his followers, uh, let's say, John 15, 18 through 21. But, uh, you know, like Paul uh, generalizes it in 2 Timothy 3.12, when he says that everyone 
who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And so as I was teaching others on encouraging others, I could not be surprised. And honestly, I can say I never asked when I was in prison in Sudan for helping the persecuted Christians that uh, I would wonder why that happened to me. I mean, I also considered as a part of my risk of my, uh, my job in one sense. When days became weeks and weeks became months and months became a year, of course, I have asked the question, how long, Lord? And that was an honest question out of my heart at that time. Just to start a little bit more of the context, Peter, for the situation, take us back to the story you share in the book in terms of when you first get arrested. When did you think things were going in a bad direction? You were actually trying to head back home. Yeah, I was holding boarding passes in my hand uh, in the airport of Khartoum, uh, heading home for, you know, uh, spend time of Christmas with my family. You know, in one sense, at first, when they uh, stopped me, the secret police, and they started to search my bag, you know, I have experienced that several times, especially when leaving the countries of Central Asia. It was quite uh, frequent, you know, that they were searching my bag, you know, I I think that they were looking for money, maybe that uh, they're always looking for foreigners, they don't want them to take money out of the country, you know, the fact is that I, as a VOM, a regional director, I was rather always carrying money into the countries, because that was the way how we tried to help the persecuted brothers and sisters. I would say that in the moment when uh, I uh, realized that they were calling my name, that I am delaying the flight, and I realized that uh, when they took my passports, and uh, of course I said passports because I had my second passport, you know, that was my usual habit, legally holding two passports because, you know, I was traveling to many risky countries. And I think that was also for the secret policeman, a kind of sign that I must be a spy, because who travels normally with two passports? And But that was a normal thing for me, because the one was hidden always, you know, in case that I get dropped. And I think in the moment when I realized that I missed my flight, and they started to transfer me to different place, you know, there was a headquarter of the secret police. At that moment, I realized, yes, that's a different situation than a normal before departure routine check. And I started to pray more fervently and just committing. Uh, I was committing everything into the Lord's hands. And of course, the interrogation was not pleasant. It lasted nearly 24 hours. And after that, when they started to fill some papers, you know, I realized that definitely this will not be to any hotel in Khartoum. It might be to some of their prisons. And even early on, Peter, is this a situation you kind of assumed or thought it was going to be resolved quickly? Or did you have some kind of an inkling that, well, this could be a lot longer than I'm thinking? I was always hoping that uh, this may be uh, explained, you know, and uh, there's a misunderstanding, you know, will be explained and I may be released uh, even before Christmas. You know, I had a visitor uh, from the Czech embassy 11 days after the arrest. And then after that, I didn't have any meetings for, uh, I would say, two months. But the first meeting gave me some courage, you know, that uh, even though, you know, the diplomats say when they say yes, they mean maybe. When they say maybe, they mean no. And uh, uh, when a diplomat says no, he is not a diplomat anymore. So, of course, they were trying to kind of encourage me. But I heard from them that situations like my case, when a religious person is uh, being arrested in Sudan, it may last up to four months. So somehow, deep in my mind, you know, in my subconscious, the limit of like four months was in my head. And it was also affecting my prayers. You know, I remember that I was praying and I was uh, taking it by faith that I will be released by March 31st. And imagine that on March 29, uh, you know, they opened the doors of my cell. I was in solitary confinement at that time. And they command me to take all my belongings, bring me down to the bottom, uh, to the ground floor of that building of prison and gave me my carry-on luggage. And I thought I'm going home, but I was not. I was just being transferred to a different prison. That was a trick that they actually, the game that they played with me. There was a life-changing moment in my life and the change of perspective, you know, on my time in prison when I was in the second prison, which where the conditions were much, much worse. We were sometimes more than 50 people squeezed in one room, not more than 25 square meters. 
And one night they brought 12 Eritrean refugees and the Holy Spirit guided me clearly to share the gospel with them. When I did that and they responded positively, I encouraged them and all 12 of them committed their lives to Christ. We were experiencing, all of us, such a joy the rest of the night. We could not sleep. There was no place to sleep. We were squeezed in such a way. And in the morning, they called all 12 of them by names and transferred them to different prison. So I said to the Lord in my prayer, Lord, now I know why I had to be in prison four months and one day, because these people needed to hear the gospel. And they changed my whole perspective on my time in prison. And and I started to share the gospel deliberately with even the Muslim prisoners, even though it was illegal. And of course, I was punished again by being put in solitary confinement, you know. So the first two months, you know, when I was sharing the cell with ISIS fighters, ISIS sympathizers and supporters, of course, that was the most difficult time. But even at that time, the Lord gave me, you know, when I was at the bottom of my physical and emotional strength, Uh, He gave me his chance to share the gospel with these Muslim extremists and to pray for them and also to uh, not only to share the gospel with words, but also with my personal attitudes like following Christ's command that when someone strikes you on one cheek, you turn the other one to him. I can tell you honestly, that's not my normal nature. I can say honestly, it was not me. It was Christ in me who was able to turn the other cheek to them when they were beating me. But in fact, you know, that I never retaliated, that made these extremists even more furious, and they continued to design new ways of beatings and torture. Eventually, they decided that they will torture me with waterboarding. And imagine these were young, strong, intelligent, highly educated, university educated, and diplomas from not only Africa, but also from European universities, doctors, pharmacists, engineers, and from various countries. And One of them was a Libyan guy who, at the age of 12, was already sent by his father to be a bodyguard of Osama bin Laden. He was highly respected by others. They called him man of sword, but that uh, being the bodyguard was not the true reason for being called a man of sword. He was actually one of those murderers who beheaded the 20 Coptic and one African Christian on a Libyan shore in February 2015. A few months later, he shared the cell with me. He was also threatening on my life. But I always encourage people in the free countries to pray for those six ISIS members that the Lord Jesus would reveal himself to them as the Lord, Savior, and God. You know, Christianity is the only religion that is teaching its followers to love their enemies. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 44, But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And that's, I think, the message that I want to pass on the Christians, you know, not to pray only for the persecuted brothers and sisters and their family members, but also to pray for their persecutors and pray that the Lord Jesus would give them, you know, as Paul says in Ephesians 6, uh, 18 through 20, he said that pray for me, and he was in prison at that time, that the Lord Jesus would give me the right words to preach the gospel whenever I open my mouth, because he says, I am the ambassador of the gospel in chains. Those brothers and sisters that are in prison and uh, and they're persecuted, they're the ambassadors of the gospel in chains. They're also ambassadors of the gospel to those persecutors. So we should never forget to pray for those persecutors as well. And Peter, at one point, you are given a Bible. Talk to us a bit about how did Bible study take on a whole new level, especially while you were in solitary confinement. I feel like that's a powerful part of your journey. I could not have a Bible for the first five months. You know, the Muslim extremists, they had three, four, five printouts of Korans in each cell. But I got my Bible in the second prison, in the solitary confinement, you know, after I was punished again by sharing the gospel with Muslims. And I was uh, in the solitary confinement when the consular officer brought me a Czech Bible. And I was so happy to have the Czech Bible that I immediately started to read, standing at the window during the daylight time, maybe from 8 in the morning till 5 p.m. But I finished reading the Bible from Genesis to Revelation within three weeks. That documents how hungry I was after the Word of God. And this Word of God spoke to me in an absolutely new way. Were passages that I thought I understood, uh, started, I started to understand them in a totally different way. 
And those passages that I uh, did not understand or I didn't like, like a book of Revelation, I started to understand. And, you know, that was all the preparation. Imagine for three months in solitary confinement, I didn't have anything else to do than just read the Bible. So, you know, within the nine months I had the Bible, I think I read the Old Testament six times, New Testament ten times. And I uh, was uh, reading Psalms, my most favorite books of the Bible for me, regularly. And that was all arranged by our Sovereign Lord as a preparation for the coming six months in the next prison. Uh, because, you know, our court case started after eight months, and we were transferred to a huge prison with capacity like 10,000 prisoners. And they put us into the cell with 100 prisoners. And this prison was unique in one sense because it had many mosques for each 400 Muslims. There was a mosque. But for the non-Muslim prisoners, the prison authorities arranged one of the, they changed one of these cells into a small chapel. And from the first day, every week, at least once a week, sometimes twice a week, I was able to preach to absolutely hopeless, desperate and forgotten people. And to see them being reconciled with God through the blood of Jesus when they responded to the gospel. These six months, you know, when the number of attendees grew up from something like 20 to maybe more than 200 within six months, these were the best six months, not only of my prison life, but they were the best six months of my life, period. I've never experienced so many people responding positively to the gospel that I preach. And you can see now, I plan to go to Sudan for four days only. The Lord has turned these four days into 445 days in his divine plans. And that's what ex exactly Isaiah 55, 8 through 10 says. The Lord says, my thoughts are not like your thoughts. My ways are not like your own ways. As the heavens is higher than the earth, so much higher are my ways and thoughts with you than yours. And that's exactly what the Lord intended. And, uh, you know, uh, when we realized, me and the other two Sudanese pastors, when we realized that we stopped being concerned how much more time we will have to spend in prison, you know, we knew that the Lord was in control. Of course, we were appreciating the news about many Christians praying for us, signing uh, petitions, online petitions. There was uh, nearly half a million under one online petitions uh, by, uh, organized by Citizen Go, uh, uh, NGO based in Spain, for our release. But there were many Christians also sending letters to various embassies around the world, Sudanese embassies around the world. That was all extremely encouraging. But, you know, I always give credit to the Lord. In Proverbs 21, 1, we say, we read that the Lord is uh, directing the heart of the king in the direction, uh, like the riverbed of the river, in the direction he wants. The same President Bashir, you know, who called me a criminal that needed to be punished when he spoke with the Czech ambassador. He granted me the pardon, you know, after being sentenced to life imprisonment in Sudan, because the Lord was in control the whole time. And when the readers open my book, Imprisoned with ISIS, they can realize from the first page to the last page how the Lord was in control throughout the whole time. Peter, you've shared briefly about some of the difficulties that you faced while in prison. During some of those darkest moments, how was God using your family back home and friends and acquaintances across the globe to pray and intercede for you during some of those darkest times? That's a very important lesson that I have learned in whilst being in prison, the power of prayer. Imagine I am amidst the, of the enemies of the gospel, uh, six of them strong fighters that uh, I never knew literally from which side they will hit me, slap my face, or hit me with this wooden stick or uh, kick me with their legs. And uh, of course, at 9.30 or 8.30 already after the last prayer, the nightlife started in prison. Sometimes they could stay awake till 2 a.m. But to my big surprise, each night, being amidst the crowded cell that is designed for one prisoner, but we were seven people there, I was amazed that I lay down on the floor and I was able to fall asleep at 9 p.m. or after 9 p.m. And I was so thankful to the Lord. And I was wondering, why do I have this privilege? I can guarantee you, if you lose that much weight, like I lost within the first three months, 55 pounds of my body weight. Within the first months, I lost nearly half of my blood through internal bleeding. And, you know, if you would not have a sleep, you will lose your mind after one week. 
But I had this sleep every night. Only, uh, I think, maybe two months later, I got uh, uh, the first letter from my family. And I could uh, understand why I had this privilege to fall asleep. You know, in our home church, when I did not return, immediately the pastor started uh, the praying chain and fasting chain. There was a time unlimited fasting chain in our small congregation, maybe with 100 people. And there were days when not only one, but maybe sometimes three people were fasting on the day. But on top of that, in our church, we have a prayer application that when people sign up for this, their smartphones will ring with a reminder at a certain time. At 8 p.m., uh, Czech Republic winter time, they made an agreement that they will stop doing their activities and they will go on their knees and pray fervently for me. And now the most important thing is that the time difference between the Czech Republic winter time and Sudan is one hour. Those people were actually praying from 9 p.m. till 10 p.m. As a result of their answered prayers, I could fall asleep peacefully and sleep till maybe 4 a.m. You know, when I heard, read about that, I made a commitment that when I will be released, I will encourage people to pray for our brothers and sisters and pray for their family members and just lift them up. You know, of course, we serve the omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient God who could help these brothers and sisters. But he is the Lord of fellowship. He wants to hear from us and he wants to answer our prayers. That's a wonderful lesson that I have learned, you know. And of course, I got convicted by the Holy Spirit how often someone asked me for prayers. And I just said, yes, yes, I will keep you in my prayers. You know, you know, this is a kind of social Christian phrase. I will keep you in my prayers. But I was not really doing that. So that has definitely changed my view on prayer. And I had many more other experiences, you know, how prayer was effective and how the Lord directed my family my Bible study group in my hometown to pray at a certain time when I really needed that. Peter, I just appreciate you taking the time to share your story, share your journey with my listeners today. I actually listened to this on audiobook and it is just a challenging, it's an encouraging story. Everybody needs to read this. Everybody needs to listen to this. So Peter, for the listeners who'd like to find out more about the book, find out more about the work of Voice of the Martyrs, where are some of the places we can do that on the web? Uh, certainly they can go to the uh, website of the Voice of the Martyrs, uh, persecution.com, or they can find the book on Amazon or any other booksellers. You know, the book Imprisoned with Isis was published by Salem Books, and I'm sure it's available in many bookstores, online bookstores in America. Well, like we do with every episode, we'll have detailed links in the show notes, places where you can pick up your very own copy of the book and places where you can learn about the work of Voice of the Martyrs as well. It's time to bring this episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Peter Yashik. Once again, our book today was Imprisoned with Isis, Faith in the Face of Evil. For more on the book, head on over to persecution.com. That's also where you can find out more about the work of Voice of the Martyrs. And Peter, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's truly been an honor and a privilege to have you on the show. Thank you for the invitation. God bless you all.